to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ where there are problems in the church you can be sure there are people there acting like spiritual babies and where there are spiritual babies in the church there will always be church problems. Welcome to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. In Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he writes to them to deal with certain problems that are going on in the church. But the main reason these problems are occurring is that some Christians are now acting like spiritual babies. Think about the problems they're facing. In chapter 1 and 2, they're dealing with problems related to division over human wisdom. Chapters 3 and 4, they're elevating preachers to places they ought not to be. In chapter 5, you've got gross immorality in the church. Chapter 6, brethren are suing one another. Chapter 7, there are problems over marriage. Paul deals with idolatry in the book of 1 Corinthians. Problems over miracles. Problems over the resurrection of Christ and giving. Why did all these problems occur? Friend, the key passage that helps us understand why there are problems in the church in Corinth and why there are problems today is found in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. Here is the root of the problem. Could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And so the problem was there are people acting like babies. They'd not grown up and matured in Christ as they needed to. Friend, part of the Christian life is that every day I must awake and strive to grow and mature as a Christian. One of the strongest rebukes in the Bible is found in Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 12. The Hebrew writer says, By this time, meaning some have been Christians 30 years, by this time you ought to be teachers, yet you need someone to teach you again the first principles, the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. They should have been eating of the meat of the Word but they'd not grown as they should have. Jesus taught us to launch out into the deep. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, and in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, we're to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, and that means I'm to grow as a Christian. Peter described it this way in 1 Peter 2, verse 2, but as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. He said later in 2 Peter 3, verse 18, we're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so where there are church problems, there's going to be spiritual immaturity. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians is written to deal with these church problems, and that's what God expects the church then to do, and the church for us today as well, to deal with the problems. Now, what are some of the initial problems? In chapter 1 and 2, Paul is writing to show that it's the gospel, the power of the cross, that saves men and women, and we must not be divided over that, and we surely must not put our faith in human wisdom and philosophy of men. In chapter 1 and 2, people are trusting men and their wisdom more than God, and it's leading to division. Now, friend, rest assured, the problem of division is a very serious problem. I want you to notice from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, what the Apostle Paul says about their division. And I want you to notice how that directly relates to denominationalism today. Notice chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, 
by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He says, It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions or divisions among you. Now I say this, each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Here Paul makes the point, let there be no division. Speak the same thing. You've all got to be of the same mind. Well, how do we speak the same thing today? Friends, we speak the same thing because we go to the same source as our authority, the Word of God. How can we all be of the same mind? Philippians 2 verse 5, if we all strive to have the mind of Christ found in the Word of God. God has always hated division. Psalm 133 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus and he said, We're to maintain the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. That bond of peace being the gospel. You see, my friends, Jesus is the head of the church. Ephesians 1 verses 21 through 23. Jesus is the one who paid the price for the church. Matthew 16 verse 18. It is His church. And thus, if we're going to have unity and not be divided, we've got to look to Him as the source of that unity. Do you remember the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17 verses 20 and 21? Here's what Jesus prayed. He said, I pray, Father, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus, in, in one of his last requests, uh, one of his things he wanted to get across to his disciples the most was how there ought to be unity among believers. Now, friends, as we think about Paul's words of encouragement concerning division here, let's also realize this has a modern day application. Imagine in your mind what they were saying in the book of 1 Corinthians or in the time of the writing of 1 Corinthians. Were you to ask people in that day and age, are you a part of the, the one body of Christ, the universal church you read about in the New Testament? They would say yes. And so imagine you've got this circle and that circle represents the one body. Now instead of all being inside that body, you now have a branch over here. I'm of Apollos. Or a branch over here, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter. They were all claiming to be of that, that one group, but they were splintering off and dividing the body of Christ. Now, did Paul say that was scriptural? Here's what he said. Let there be no divisions among you. They tried to divide and follow men in the first century, and the Holy Spirit condemned it then. And I want you to notice the modern parallel today. Were you to ask most people today, are you a part of that one universal body you read about in the New Testament, the one church? They probably say, well, yeah, I'm a part of the bigger collective group, the one body. But notice, although they would say we're part of this one church, that circle representing all believers in their mind, you then have people who say, well, I'm of the Methodist group, or I'm of the Lutheran sect, or I'm of the Presbyterian, or we really emphasize grace. I'm of the Grace Church. Now, friends, I want you to think real practically about this. If it was wrong in the first century for Christians to divide, follow the name of Paul or Cephas or Apollos, how can we say today that such is scriptural? What did God say then? Let there be no divisions. And friend, denominationalism, the following of men and their ideas and naming groups after them is clearly condemned in Scripture. Now, notice from 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13, there are really three things that must occur before you can even be a follower of a man. I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13 again. Paul says, Is Christ divided? Now notice this, Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What three things must a person, three credentials must a person meet before he can be a follower of some man? Number one, Paul said, was that person crucified for you? They must die as a sacrifice for you. Well, they say, well, I've seen people do that throughout the centuries. People have died for the cause of Christ. No, that's not the kind of sacrifice the Bible speaks of. They must die as a sinless sacrifice for you to cover your sin. Now, who can do that today? Romans 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
The scripture teaches in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 that that sin separates her from God. Romans 3 verse 10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. And so all, all men today have sinned and fallen short. Secondly, they must be crucified for you. Since no man can be a sinless sacrifice, he surely cannot be crucified in your place as an offering for sin, and then you must be baptized into their name. Even denominational groups today don't try to promote those criteria, but that's what Scripture says one must do if they are going to have followers today. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul also deals with some problems that are related to human wisdom and trusting in men more than God. And I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to learn that the power of the gospel, the message of, of Jesus dying on a cross, it was foolishness to some people. And yet to those concerned about eternal matters, the cross is God's power to save. Notice the beautiful words of 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. The scripture clearly says, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who were lost. It, fool, it pleased God through that message. What message? The cross is the way God saves people today. The power is in the gospel, not in me, not in you, not in some words of men today. It's the message of the cross that's going to save people. Romans 1.16, the Bible says the gospel is God's power unto salvation. James 1 verse 21, we receive the meekness, that implanted word which is able to save our souls. And of course, as we read in Acts chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, when the gospel went to Cornelius, the Bible says he had to hear words whereby he could be saved. What words? Of Jesus dying on a cross and what Jesus expected him to do to be right with God. And so while human philosophy may think that's crazy, while human ideas teach that you need to do other things, friends, the same old gospel they preached in the first century is the gospel that'll save, the gospel that'll save people today. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. He bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, the cross, that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. And in view of this human philosophy, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25 in a really ironic and striking language, he in essence says, you know, if God on, on his most foolish day would still be wiser than man. And man on his wisest day would be foolish in God's eyes. You know, sometimes we think that the idea of God saving people through the cross, the gospel, it's a message of foolishness. But the writer says, I want you to think about the character of God before you say that. God, were he, and he doesn't, to have a foolish day, he would be 10,000 times wiser than man on his wisest day. And were man to have a wise day, God would still see that as foolish. God is the all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful God, and He's the supreme ruler. We need to look to Him and realize He's in control in all matters. You know, Job had to learn this. Job faced a lot of problems in his life. Job lost his family, lost all that he owned. He uh, lost his health. He didn't have any friends there except for three to comfort him, and they, the Bible says they were miserable comforters. He just about lost everything. He questioned why this was happening. He wondered why God allowed it. He began to question even the nature of God. But you know what Job realized in Job 42, verses 1 through 6? Here's what he said. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. He said, I should have never opened my mouth. I couldn't even begin to comprehend or understand your power and your wisdom. You're great. I'm small. I need to hush and listen to you is in essence what Job said. And friend, how powerful that lesson is for us today. Let's stop trusting in what people say. Let's stop trusting in the foolish philosophy of men and go back to the gospel saving power. I want you to notice the words of Romans 11, verse 33, how they deal right with the heart of this message. Notice what Paul said in Romans 11, verse 33. Paul exclaimed the power of God in his message when he said, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Paul in essence said, God is the wisest one ever and we don't even know how to search out the things He knows. And so God is in control. It's His message that will save. You know, friends, as we think about 
the gospel, we need to realize that in dealing with human wisdom, in dealing with division, part of it occurs. Because sometimes we let the eloquence and the oratory skills of the messenger get in the way. But Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that it's not the power of the messenger. It's not his eloquence or wisdom that saves. In fact, we need to get out of the way when we preach the gospel and let people see the message of the cross. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what Paul says in verse 1 following. Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Notice this, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul's going to say, My speech and my wisdom, that's foolishness. The gospel's where the power is. Now, friends, as Paul spoke according to the gospel, there was power in his words because they are from God, but it wasn't his wisdom and it wasn't his eloquence that saved people. We need to realize that the gospel will save and we need not put our trust in men. We need to put our trust in the Word of God. The messenger desperately needs to get out of the way and let people see Jesus. As I think about this, it's the death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 3 that saves. It's the message of the cross. It doesn't matter how much I like or dislike someone's speaking style. If that person's preaching the gospel, that's where the power is. The power is in God and His Word. And friend, that message, Paul is going to say, should be powerfully proclaimed with the Spirit's Word. Paul said, I didn't come to you with excellence of speech, wisdom, but I did powerfully proclaim the message of Jesus and salvation through the Spirit's words. That's where our emphasis needs to be today. Too many times... We're worried about how well a person can entertain us with speaking or how many good jokes they can tell or how many funny quips they've got. We need to be asking ourselves this. Did that person, when he spoke, speak to me the Holy Spirit's words on salvation? And friend, if he did, that's where the emphasis needs to be. John 16, verse 13, Jesus promised the Spirit would come. He would guide us into all truth. By the close of the first century, in Jude, verse 3, we now have the faith delivered to all, the once for all faith delivered. That faith is found in the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. It's inspired by God. And when someone speaks as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, verse 11, we need to listen up. Our ears ought to listen up and be careful to what we hear so that we can obey God and put our trust in Him and not men. And so their problem revolved around eloquence and oratory skills, and God says, don't put your trust in that. Trust in the message of salvation found in Scripture. You know, friend, we always need to test the spirits to see if they're really of God. 1 John 4 and verse 1, If we do find them to say what God says, we need to obey it because God said it, not because man said it, no matter how good or how bad his speaking skill may be. Now, in chapter 2, Paul then deals with the, the mystery of the gospel and how that it's bound up in God's scheme of redemption. Again, not in men. Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 following, that this is something, this mystery, what is it? It's something that God predetermined, planned from eternity. 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 10, it was the working of God before time began. 1 Peter 1, verse 20, it was manifest to us now, but it was predetermined for the ages. Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11, it's the mystery from eternity that God revealed and made known to princes and principalities through the church. Here's how much God loved me and He loved you. We're living in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promise before time began. God knew we would sin. The mystery is that in the mind of God, God had already began to make a way of salvation. What is this mystery? It's something predetermined from eternity. But the Bible also tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, it's the things which God prepared for those who love Him. Speaking of God's scheme of redemption and the hope and the joy of salvation, the blessings that come from being a Christian, when I obey the gospel, these things which God prepared for those who love Him, what are they? The Bible teaches in Ephesians 1 verse 3 that all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, the scripture says that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the message, through the, the knowledge of Him who called us. And so the mystery, God, for time began, made a way of salvation. That salvation culminated in the cross of Christ. And we can now receive 
the things which God had been preparing in His scheme of redemption from eternity through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's the key. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13, Paul tells us how we can know the mystery. Friend, the only way you can know the things which God has prepared for those who love Him is through the Spirit of God revealed in the Word of God today. So many people want to talk about a good feeling or something they heard in the middle of the night, God spoke to me. How can you find out about God's mystery of salvation? The Scripture tells us, notice 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and look at what the Bible says in verse 13. Paul said, these things, the things concerning the kingdom of God, the things which God prepared for those who love Him, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul says, we're speaking to you the Holy Spirit's words concerning these things. Now friends, if we're going to find that, We've got to go to the source where those words are recorded. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you are the commandments of God. Hebrews 1 verse 1 clearly says God in various times and various ways, He spoke in time past to the, prophets by, or to the fathers by the prophets, but He has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Listen to the way Peter described it. When Peter considered... The Mount of Transfiguration and how God's voice boomed down from heaven. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. He thought about that and he said, We have the prophetic word confirmed more sure. You do well to heed it as a light that shines in a dark place. He said, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved or guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not of any private interpretation, but they wrote down what the Holy Spirit gave us. And friends, if we're going to know how to be saved, the only way to find out is to go to the Bible. It is God's power unto salvation. Hebrews 4 and verse 12, it's living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Now as you think about God's mystery and the mystery of God being bound up in His scheme of redemption and revealed to us through the Holy Spirit, we've got to realize that today we can know the mind of the Lord. He says no one knows the mind of God, but we have the mind of Christ revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. You can't know the mind of a man unless he tells you what he's thinking is Paul's point. He says we can know God's mind because he's revealed that to us. How? Well, Jesus is God with us. Remember Matthew chapter 1, you shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And thus we can know the mind of God in, in two various ways. We can know what God wants us to know on salvation about his great plan through the mind of Christ. Verse 16, Paul makes this point. Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We can have the mind of Christ today by going to the scripture and seeing how Jesus lived his life. Jesus said in John 10, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. But you know, friends, to know the mind of Christ, you've got to look to the words of Christ revealed by the Holy Spirit in Scripture. You know, it's interesting as you look in verse 13, that's exactly what Paul is pointing to. We can know the things of God because the Holy Spirit has revealed those to us in the words of Jesus and the words of inspired men. John 1 verse 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You look in that same chapter, John 1 verses 13 and 14, and you learn that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld Him as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Who is that Word? Jesus. Jesus came to earth. He lived and died. He preached the message of salvation. He brought that to men and women today, and I can know that I cannot be saved. I cannot be saved by following people today. I cannot be saved by human wisdom, but I can know for sure that I'm right with God when I put my trust in Scripture. John said it this way in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. John said, These things we write to you that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And so as you think about God's message of salvation being in the cross, being bound up in the Word of God for men and women today, you know, there are some questions we ought to ask ourselves in view of that. Number one, who are we putting our trust in today? Friend, is your salvation, is your salvation based on what family members 
or friends or religious leaders have told you to do, then friend, if so, we kindly say to you, you cannot be sure that you're right with God. The only way you can know you're saved is when you go to the Word of God. John 8 verse 32, Jesus said you can know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We must not trust in people no matter how good their intentions are. The Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 3 verse 5. And the Bible also says in Proverbs 16 verse 25 and 14 12 that there's a way that seems right to a man but the end thereof is the way of death. And so we've got to put our trust in God and His wisdom. Have you trusted in others or have you trusted in God? A second question then. Have you, in view of the fact that God's salvation is found in the gospel of Christ, have you changed your mind to make it like the mind of God? In Christianity, we've got to transform our mind and our way of thinking to God's way of thinking. Romans 12, verse 2. God said in Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 12, that my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. Have you decided to change your mind to say to yourself, I'm not going to live the way I want to. I want to see what God says I need to do to be saved. And then the final question, my friend, have you obeyed the message of Jesus, the message of the cross concerning salvation? If not, you cannot be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If you've put your trust in salvation on what some book or some idea of man said or what you've always thought or always felt, then friend, we kindly say to you, your salvation is not sure. You are not saved by the grace of God and the cross of Christ because you've not obeyed the gospel. But friend, more than anything, we want you to have salvation. We want you to put your trust in the message of God in the cross of Christ and you can do that today. Jesus taught that we first must be willing to believe in Him. John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Jesus also taught us that we must be willing to repent of sin, to turn from our evil ways and turn to God. Luke 13 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus also taught we must confess Him before men. Matthew 10 verse 32 and 33 3, Romans 10 verse 10 and the Savior said to contact salvation we must be baptized. Jesus said he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Have you been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2 verse 38. Friend, if not, the, the message today is this. Stop trusting in human wisdom and start trusting in the message of the cross. It is the way of salvation. May God help us to put our trust in His Word and never in men. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned for about Christ lost souls, not your wallet. God be the glory. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee 37111.